can I have you a little bit quieter? My ear is playing up, my tummy is in total mess, uh, and maybe I will die next week, not you. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> so. <laughs> Good, we gave each other uh, extensions in every. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so. Um, what we want to talk, to talk today is uh, one of the biggest mysteries of the universe. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay, so this is a problem, right? I give you a propositional formula, okay? And very simple one that looks something like this, P1 or not P2 or P3 or say not P4. And uh, say P2 or not P3 or not P4 or P5 and uh, say P1 or uh, P2 or P3 or P4 or P5, say. Okay? And uh, then I give you also for all of these letters, P2, P3, P4, P5, uh, I guess that's about it. And I tell you this one is true, this one is false, this one is true, this is true, and this is false. Can you find out whether this formula is true or false under this assignment is poly in polynomial time? Yes. yes. How would you do it? Students are absolutely creative with coming up <laughs> with. <laughs> it's very simple because we have true tables of disjunction, negation, and conjunction. You just substitute, and uh, in linear time, you can find out whether the formula is true or it is not true. But how about now this problem? I assume that I did not give you the assignment. And I ask you, is there an assignment of variables that makes this formula true? Does this sound as a harder problem than just verifying whether given assignment is true? For given assignment, the formula is true or not? So the question is, is solving this equation, this equal to true, is this a harder problem than verifying whether certain assignment uh, solves this equation? Well, if you, I really got, like, if you consider the number of the propositions to be like a fixed constant number, then you're going to have like just file two to that number all of the different possibilities of any constant t. Uh, like if, if you're considering it like you've got five propositions, like which five things which could either be true or false, then there's two of the five different possible yes. ways. Uh, yes. Yes. So here we are assuming a formula has m uh, conjuncts uh, and uh, n variables. Right, so they're both parameters. So what does your gut feeling tell you? Figuring out whether you can make this formula true. Is this harder than just verifying whether certain assignment makes it true? Is this harder problem? Yes, very good. Well, guess what? The most embar one of the most embarrassing things in mathematics nowadays is uh, 
that we cannot prove that. And that's the most, one of the 10 uh, problems in mathematics that have bounty of one million dollars for a person who solves it. Uh, uh, and it's the famous question whether P is equal to NP. So the question of, uh, we cannot prove uh, that figuring out uh, whether a formula has a truth assignment that makes it true, we cannot prove that this is harder than um, verifying uh, whether something is, uh, whether some assignment makes it true. Um, and there is, the number of people who try to solve uh, this problem is staggering. It includes uh, some of the most famous mathematicians. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, some people that do research in computational complexity would probably shoot me for what I'm going to say, but we have made zilch progress towards figuring out whether it's true or false. We are as far from the solution <coughs> as uh, we have uh, been uh, uh, ever since uh, uh, Steve Cook and uh, uh, Robert Karp uh, uh, formulated this uh, perennial question whether P is equal to NP. So, um, and the, the problem is extraordinarily simple to formulate. Uh, so let's be a little bit more precise. Uh, we have to define what is P time computability. Uh, we say that a decision problem, so what's a decision problem? Something that has, uh, who, we, whose answer is just yes or no. For example, uh, vertex cover is the following problem. You are given a graph, and the question is, uh, can you color at most n many vertices uh, of this graph uh, so that every edge has at least one vertex colored, right? So can you select, uh, You are given a graph. Uh, can you select a few vertices, say M many vertices, say here is, uh, say, four vertices. Can I color four vertices so that uh, uh, every uh, edge uh, has at least one vertex colored. So uh, say let's try with this uh, and then this is two and this is three and now if I color this one I think I'll be fine, right? Every edge has at least one vertex colored. For this edge it's this one, for this edge is that one and so forth. Now uh, so a problem is p time computable, decision problem is p time computable if and only if uh, it has an algorithm that solves it in time that is polynomial in the size of the input. So for example, if you encode this graph by an adjacency matrix and uh, uh, you write in binary your limit for the number of colored vertices. The question is, is there a solution to this problem that runs in time length of encoding, say, to the power 100? Doesn't matter how large it is, uh, right? Uh, so this is kind of a little bit sloppy because what is an algorithm? What are, how do we count? Uh, uh, the number of steps uh, it takes to execute an algorithm. So we use a formalism that is actually just a fancy way of encoding our intuition that something is solvable by a procedure, deterministic procedure in polynomial time, right? How many of you know what a Turing machine is? Who has seen a Turing machine? 
You haven't seen a Turing machine. No? Uh, okay, so what do they teach you in courses that you take? Uh, in <laughs> so what is a Turing machine? Uh, the point is uh, we want to formalize uh, uh, the notion of an effective algorithm that runs fast uh, in as simple way as possible uh, and in a way that is uh, as amenable to mathematical analysis as possible. And so a uh, Turing machine is simply an abstract device that looks like this. It's uh, an infinite tape in both directions, right, that is divided in cells. Okay. And you have a reading and writing head that looks like this, right? And here you have internal states of the machine. And um, the input is written in some finite alphabet. It can be just the binary 0, 1. It doesn't make much difference. But the input is written here, right? And the machine has a special state that is called yes state. And it, the machine can do only the following. Depending on what is the value of the cell that it reads at the moment, and depending on what is its internal state, which is finite, say cardinality of all states is just n. Okay, so depending in what state the machine is and depending on what it reads, it can do only the following. It can change this symbol into another symbol and after that it can either move to the left or move to the right for one cell only. And what it will do depends entirely on a table that looks like this. Here are states uh, S0, S1, up to uh, say Sn, and say state Sn is yes, we call it uh, yes state. And here are symbols that it can see, sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma k, where this can be really just 0 and 1. And then the table uh, in a cell here, say, that corresponds to state Si and certain symbol sigma j in this state says uh, uh, if, uh, if you are in state Si and you see symbol sigma j, then change sigma j into some not other symbol, maybe sigma k, right? And uh, move left or right, right? So, and change state into another state um, as, uh, say, P, right? So it's essentially a computer program, right? That says, uh, if the internal state is SI and you see symbol sigma J, right? Then change this symbol, the table will say change sigma j into sigma k, uh, change the state from uh, sigma i to some state sigma sp, and move to the left or move to the right. Okay? Now, amazing thing is that uh, the action of the machine is totally local. The machine having just a few states, uh, cannot memorize where it is or how it got there. It has only a finitely many states, uh, right? And uh, its action only depends on the state and what it reads. Uh, it, uh, so if it's in the same state and sees the same uh, input somewhere else, it will have to do exactly the same thing. 
So this looks ex to be extremely restricted what the machine can do. But Turing, being a genius, proved that, uh, well, proved. He kind of conjectured that uh, anything that we can do in finitely many steps, even by any machine, finite state, any machine that at the, uh, at the moment that we have, that this can be, this is precisely what this machine can do. Right, so it's kind of a bit shocking <coughs> that this is as powerful as any supercomputer and it's actually much more powerful because the tape is infinite. And obviously the cells can be used as a memory, right? You can write arbi into arbitrary many cells, right? Now, a few years, this was in 1930s, uh, I think. So few years after that, uh, Alonzo Church uh, introduced something called lambda calculus and then proved that Turing machine can do precisely what uh, you can compute in this formal calculus called lambda calculus. And then a little bit later, of course, von Neumann came up with the von Neumann machine. And if you idealize it and allow the machine to have infinite memory, lo and behold, you can prove uh, that uh, um, what that Turing machine can do exactly what von Neumann machine can do. So, of course, we cannot prove uh, a statement that says uh, um, Turing machine can do exactly everything what's computable because there is no uh, there is no strict uh, rigorous definition of what computable means by what ways by what means uh, right um, and soon afterwards uh, uh, this was replaced by also a fragment of arithmetic essentially uh, using uh, plus and times. Uh, and uh, um, something called mu operator. Uh, and it turns out that all these formalisms capture exactly the same class of functions. And this is taken as a kind of indicator that lo and behold, this is precisely what is uh, uh, computable, right? That this is a correct definition of computability. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the Turing machine also offers an example of what is not computable. So consider the following problem. If I give you the table and I give you the input, the question is, will your machine ever stop? And machine stops when it uh, uh, reaches some special halting state uh, uh, as some design state, right? Uh, and it turns out that this question is undecidable. There is no algorithm which, given the table and given the input, can tell you whether the machine will stop infinitely many steps or not. Okay, but for practical purposes, this is kind of theology because uh, what if the machine will stop, but it will stop in the number of steps that is uh, two to the two to the two to the two to the n, uh, many steps. Uh, for all practical purposes, this machine never stops, right? Because probably the time will end before the computation is over, right? So people came up with a small refinement of this. Namely, you require uh, your machine to stop after number of steps that is polynomial in the length of the input. Uh, let's write it like this. Say, uh, length of the input to the power 100 is good enough, right? 
So we say that something is computable in polynomial time if there exists a natural number k so that for any input the machine will stop in number of steps that is at most length of input to the power k, right? This is what we call that a algorithm is feasible. Of course, people have objections to that because if uh, uh, n is 100, then uh, what's the use, uh, uh, you know, if the length is 100 and 100 to 100 is just hopelessly large. But uh, uh, it turns out that the formalism is very good for uh, kind of uh, analyzing uh, uh, problems and the fact that uh, you can be as generous as you want uh, uh, with the time uh, is not a major drawback. Okay, so that's one uh, formalism of the deterministic Turing machine. Now, what is a non-deterministic uh, polynomial time machine, right? Well, it is exactly, we say that the decision problem is in non-deterministic polynomial time if it does the following. Here, on the left of zero, you place the encoding of the input, okay? And... Uh, the Turing machine actually looks uh, exactly um, the same as this machine, except that it allows another input, right? And we say that something is computable non-deterministically in polynomial time, namely decidable. Let's uh, limit ourselves only to yes, no problems, like is there a, a vertex cover of size n and things like that, uh, right? When the answer is only yes and no, to keep things simple at the moment. So something is non-deterministically computable if there is an input here such that with that particular input, the Turing machine ends up in state yes, right? What is this extra space uh, uh, used for? This is exactly, for example, for this problem, uh, if I put evaluation of the letters, then of course machine will be able, and here I encode my formula, then the machine will s stop in a state yes, just in case if the, if this, it's usually called guess, if this input is a solution to your problem, right? So this looks kind of, sometimes it's called, non, why it's called non-deterministic? Well, you can tweak the definition a little bit and say this. You, um, you write the, your question here and then machine, goes into random writing uh, and goes to the right and writes a, st a string here and then returns back to the deterministic functioning and your answer is yes, just in case for some guess the answer will be yes. Right, so this is definition of non-deterministic polynomial time. What we cannot prove is that uh, this machine, right, non-deterministic machine, can actually decide more things than just plain deterministic machine, even though this kind of sounds uh, very plausible, because this essentially, this machine simply verifies whether the input here is appropriate uh, solution for the problem here. Now this all looks a little bit kind of, okay, you know, mathematicians come up with all sorts of strange things that uh, 
are interesting, but how is this uh, uh, going to help us for practical uh, purposes? What is the relevance for, uh, to computer scientists that are interested in real life problems, okay? Well, it turns the fall out, uh, the, in fact, Cook. So you see, around the time, this was in, when was that? In early 60s, I believe. People were trying to solve very practical problems. What are the problems? The problems is, for example, the vertex cover. And even more important problem is something called the traveling salesman problem. What is traveling salesman problem? You are given a map of cities, right? And you know the distances between the cities, right? And your question is, is there a trajectory that visits every city once and then returns into the starting city S that is shorter than certain limit L, right? So I'm giving you a map and a bound and you have to determine, is it possible to choose ordering of in what order you visit the cities so that the whole tour will be shorter than given L? This is obviously, uh, you know, practically extremely important problem. If you are the post office and you have a bunch of mail to deliver, you want to choose the shortest possible uh, path, right? So this is even more, uh, uh, a more general problem that uh, one might want to, um, uh, to solve, uh, to try to solve, right? Um, and a whole bunch of scheduling problems on jobs on processors, uh, then uh, the question, you are given a set of numbers, uh, uh, split it in two, so that the differences between the two sets are as sim small as possible, right? You remember we did that one using dynamic programming, uh, reducing it to knapsack, but knapsack ran in exponential time in terms of the um, uh, in terms of the size of the knapsack, right? So people were trying to find polynomial time algorithm to solve these important problems, okay? Then Steve Cook showed the following uh, interesting thing that any problem that can be reducible by something solvable in non-deterministic time on a Turing machine is in fact, uh, all of these pro problems can be solved if you could solve this famous SAT problem, which is just that, given a propositional formula, can you find the evaluation of letters that make this formula true, right? If you can answer this question, then you can find an algorithm that runs, say if you have an oracle that tells you answer to this, then any problem solvable in non-deterministic polynomial time, you can solve it in polynomial time. Huh? Well, again, you say um, big deal, so the, the family has a, so to speak, universal problem, but it's still mathematical curiosity because who cares whether some propositional formula has a satisfying assignment or not. And then Dick Carp comes into uh, the play and in a seminal paper he shows that I think, um, was it original number 17 problems that are the most actively researched and that people were trying to find P time. Uh, algorithms are actually equivalent to this problem, right? So now this becomes extremely important question because if you could solve satisfiability in uh, polynomial time, 
you can then solve uh, any problem, for example, vertex cover or traveling salesman problem, you can also solve it in polynomial time. And that's what gave uh, uh, this importance to NP-completeness. Now, as I mentioned, no one can prove that such universal NP problems can be, cannot be solved in polynomial time, even though almost everyone, I maybe probably everyone saying, believes that this is indeed the case that uh, problems, non-deterministic problem, namely the problem, the question of is there a guess that makes uh, that satisfy. So what would be a non-deterministic part uh, uh, here? For example, how would you solve non-deterministically vertex cover? So the question is, can you color n vertices uh, so that uh, um, every edge has at least one vertex colored? What would be the guess? The guess would be subset of vertices, uh, because then in polynomial time you can simply check, is it true that every edge has at least one vertex in the given set? If it's, uh, if it's traveling salesman problem, what will be the guess? Actually, a guess will be the whole trajectory. It's just a permutation of vertices, and lo and behold, you can then compute the lengths of the edges between consecutive problems, consecutive points, and see whether it is smaller or equal uh, than uh, L, right? So this is really the kind of amazing, uh, but it was, you would not believe how much effort, and not only of computer scientists, but also of mathematicians, um, you know, famous set theories, how much effort was put into resolving this. Uh, and there is only one partial result, famous Rasborov's theorem, uh, but it is so weak that it doesn't come anywhere near uh, the, the true problem, but that's the only thing that can be, so, that can be considered partial progress towards the solution. Otherwise, we are L as ignorant uh, about the state of affairs here as uh, we were when these things were first uh, introduced. Um, okay, so now uh, what we want to show is, uh, uh, we in fact want to show that uh, uh, some of the famous f problems are, uh, in fact, NP-complete. Okay, so you understand what is the SAT problem. Now, three SAT problem is a problem that uh, restricts uh, all of the cases to have at most three variables. <coughs> Okay, now if this is restricted to only two variables, then in fact it is solvable in polynomial time. So do it as an exercise, uh, show that if you have a formula that is of the form say P1 or P2 and uh, uh, P2 or not P3 and so forth, that has only, each clause contains only two literals. Literal is either a letter or negated letter. So uh, show that there exists uh, a polynomial time procedure that decides uh, whether 2SAT is, uh, so 2SAT uh, is uh, in P. There is a polynomial time algorithm that decides uh, uh, whether the formula has solution or not. Now, amazingly, what happens is uh, the moment you allow uh, three variables, the problem becomes as hard as if you allow any number of variables. 
So we will now show that uh, 3 sat is NP complete. Uh, I.e. Uh, if we could solve um, 3 sat um, uh, by uh, procedure, uh, then uh, we can uh, solve a general set with polynomial overhead. Right, so we want to show, so the, this is a typical pattern how you prove that something is NP-complete. It's very simple, but students often make uh, mistakes. You don't prove that something is NP-complete by proving that it is reducible to a known NP-complete problem. It's the other way around. So if uh, 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 a problem P, uh, well, problem pi, uh, ah, sorry, if a, if a, uh, if a uh, NP complete problem is uh, uh, reducible in P time uh, to a problem uh, pi, then pi must be also NP complete. Why is this so? Well, if I have an NP complete problem that is reducible in polynomial time to a problem pi, then any other NP problem is reducible by as, because this is NP complete problem, it's reducible to this problem, and because this is reducible to pi, then by composition you get that this NP problem is reducible to pi as well. So what we want to show here is that uh, any three sat, any sat is reducible to a three sat. And the trick is very, very simple how to do that. You introduce more variables, right? So you do the following. You break this, you take the first two, okay? So you will have P2 or not P3, and then, and, oh, sorry, or Q1. And then you have and, and then where you stopped, you go not Q1, or what's left is not P4, or Q2, and uh, finally we have here, um, let me see, so it will be uh, not Q2, uh, or uh, P, uh, we didn't have to do, okay, I can put here, I can make it a little bit simpler. I can actually finish here with or P5. So notice what we are doing here. So we simply chain things, right? Now the question is whether you can make 
let's see whether you can make this formula true, right? Well, when will this be true? This will be true if one of these guys is true. But that's precisely when this is true. Why? Well, if either P2 is true or P3 is false, well, we have uh, a reason that makes this true. Um, if this is false, and we, this is true, so this is then false and false, then if this is true, then Q1 must be true, but then it will force not Q1 to be false. So if this bracket is true, at least one of these two has to be true, and voila, we find a witness for the truth of this. Yes? Can we do the general set for loop with two samples? Yes. Uh, why is it not possible to reduce those two samples? Well, that's a very good uh, question, uh, because you see, uh, okay, let me show you and it will answer your question. So um, let's do this one to reduce it into three sets. And you will see immediately where three comes into play. Here it is. How do we break this? We go as follows. P1 or P2 or uh, Q1, the new variable and then and, then not Q1, or P3, or Q2. And then uh, not Q2, or P4, or P5. You see, in order to chain things, you need one payload for one of the letters, and you need two hooks to write this, this letter simply attaches these two, this letter attaches these two, right? Because what is the argument now? Assume that this formula is true, right? Then for this to be true, either this has to be true or that true or Q1. If either one of these is true, we are done. This must be true. If they are both false, then Q1 must be true. But now this Q1 being true is forced here to be false, right? So if this is true, then it must be true because this or this is true. If P3 is true, voila, we are done. If P3 is false, then Q2 has to be true, but then this forces here this to be false, and then finally here. So 3 is needed because you need one space for the payload and two hooks to attach uh, in the chain, right? So you can transform any formula of an any number of letters by uh, this chaining business into formulas that have uh, only three, uh, three letters. Okay, so uh, this shows that 3SAT is NP-complete. Let us now show something really nice. Let us now show that vertex cover is NP-complete. And we do that by reducing 3SAT to vertex cover. And you know this uh, CARPS paper is just a, a fireworks of brilliant ideas. It's all kind of combinatorial uh, tricks. Uh, and it's probably one of the most important papers in computer science ever written. So um, we want to show so we want to reduce 3SAT to um, vertex cover, right? Vertex cover is obviously NP. If I give you a guess which is a set forms a, a cover of given size, then obviously you can verify it in polynomial time. Now, how do we do that? So what does 3SAT look like? Well, it looks like this, P1 or P2 or not P3, right? And uh, say P2 or P4 or not P1, uh, and uh, things like that. 
Now you do the following thing. You construct a graph that has segments like this, as many as you have letters. So if this will correspond to letter P1, this will correspond to letter P2, this will correspond to the letter P3, this to the letter P4. Okay, say we have only these. Now, so each letter gets a segment like this. Okay, now each clause gets a triangle. Voila, each clause gets a triangle. And now you do the following. One end of each segment will be called P1 and the other end will be called not P1. This one will be called P2 and not P2. And this one will be P3 and this one will be not P3 and so forth. So how do I map this? Now I take this triangle that corresponds to the first clause. It's P1, so I connect P1 with one of the vertices. Okay, then I have P2. I collect, connect P2 with another vertex. And that it has not P3, I connect the third one with not P3. And I do the same for all other vertices. And this will be my graph. And the cover will be uh, uh, that we are looking for will be number n that is equal to the number of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, variables uh, plus two times number of clauses. Okay? I claim this graph has a vertex cover of this size just in case this formula has satisfying assignment. Right? It's a real magic. Why is this so? Well, let's see. If a vertex cover has this many, if this is the bound, right? We have as many letters as we have this is how many segments we have. And each segment has to have at least one vertex covered, right? On the other hand, among these triangles, we have these three edges, at least two vertices have to be covered, right? But uh, this means uh, that uh, if there is vertex cover not exceeding this number, this will happen actually just in case uh, um, every triangle got precisely two points colored and every, um, every segment got precisely one end covered, uh, colored. Now, what's the trick? You look at every clause, two vertices are covered, but this cannot be covered because obviously <coughs> to have vertex cover with these many elements, it must be that precisely one point here is everywhere chosen and everywhere here two points are chosen, right? So this means one vertex will not be covered, but this means that the other end has to be colored and the satisfying assignment is consists of the, the truth values are given to whatever edge of the corresponding variable is uh, chosen. It will be true if P3 is chosen. If uh, colored vertex is not P3, then P3 is said to false, right? So, um, you see, this system will have a vertex cover just in case this formula has a satisfying assignment. Okay, now 
we will do more. What is now important part for practicing uh, computer scientists? Consider the following problem. Um, what is the shortest path between two vertices in a graph? And uh, uh, what is the longest path between the two non-self-intersecting uh, vertex, uh, not non-self-intersecting uh, uh, path? Um, finding the shortest path, the length of the shortest path, that's piece of cake, you, we know how to do that. Uh, but uh, finding the longest one is NP-hard. So what I want to tell you is this. Uh, the edge between what can be done and what is hopeless is kind of pretty, uh, you know, in a, it looks pretty blurry, you know, similar things turned out to be of profoundly different complexity. So it is good to know which problems are NP-complete uh, so that you don't try to solve them, <laughs> seriously. So uh, because they are hopeless. Right? Now, what do we do when a problem is hopeless? Approximate. We approximate it. So what we will show is this. Uh, while uh, finding uh, a minimal vertex cover is NP-hard, uh, you can find in polynomial time a cover that is at most twice as large as uh, the minimal Cover. How would you find a um, vertex cover that is at most, this is your homework problem for the next week. So this is the problem. Um, given a graph, produce a subset that is a coloring for the graph, which means every edge has at least one end in your set that is no larger than once the minimal possible. It's a very pretty and a little bit counterintuitive construction, but uh, it's not that hard. So play with this uh, uh, until next, next week.